Hello, Jan Genies. Before we get started, Rich and I want to let you in on some even more exciting updates for our Patreon subscribers. As you know, Patreon is a site where listeners can pledge a small monthly amount, either five or ten dollars, to support the cost of bringing you your favorite podcast. All patrons get early access to new Cutoff Jeans episodes before they're released to the public. But the most exciting new perk is that all of our patrons will be able to listen to an exclusive bonus episode of the podcast every other week. Topics include personal stories that I'm not ready to share publicly, conversations with family and friends. And sometimes we'll devote an entire episode to other subjects we love, like musical theater or classic television. Rich and I enjoy bringing you the Cutoff Jeans podcast, and it would mean so much if you would consider supporting our labor of love. Just go to patreon.com slash cutoff jeans podcast. Thank you so much, my Jen Genies. And now, on with the show. Is your family tree a mystery? Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip hip hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In cutoff jeans. <laughs> Welcome to Cut Off Jeans, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon Jackson. I'm a genetic genealogist, henceforth known as a Gen Genie. And I am Richard Castle, the co-host and producer of this podcast on this windy afternoon. How are you, Julie? Windy. It feels like fall all of a sudden. I love it. (laughs) It does. It's still not cool enough, though, to be fall. I was just up in uh, Cambria, which for people who don't live, uh, you know, for our listeners who don't know California, that's like the central coast and it's so beautiful up there and it's it's a whole other climate and there's Mm -hmm. and the best part about it there's wine tasting what more do you (laughs) need we did plenty of that yeah comfortable weather wine bob's your uncle (laughs) exactly (laughs) i was watching some show oh it was a a show called mrs davis it's on peacock which is actually it's really good but there's an aussie character and and he said bob's your uncle and i'm like you know the only other person i've ever heard say that is julie (laughs) really all australians say it (laughs) and some brits too i didn't realize when you said it that it was an australian thing though you know because yeah you know i I say things and i figure well it might maybe it's just a new england thing or it could be anything you know well it's always been part of my vernacular and the first time i said it in front of my husband, he looked at me like, Bob is my damn uncle, <laughs> actually. And I'm like, oh, I had an Uncle Bob, too. Yeah. He could, so, so whenever we say it, we go, we like find a relative's name, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot to talk about today, don't we? Have we have so much to talk about today. Every time I think I see something about DNA in the news, I'm like, oh, I'm going to send that to Julie so we could talk about it on the show. And then mm-hmm. I realize there's so many things. So, um, so many things. So let's get into it, shall we? All right. Let's start with the lighter story. Yes. Um, you guys may have seen that Kerry Washington recently discovered uh, that her dad is not her biological father. Mm. And she now knows her story. So Kerry Washington is opening up about a startling revelation regarding her parents. In her new memoir, Thicker Than Water, the 46-year-old scandal star shares that she recently learned that her father, Earl Washington, is not her biological father. It's news that sent her on her current journey of self-discovery. Wow. She said it really turned her world upside down. No kidding. Ask any NPE or MPE out there. It's, right. it's a trauma uh, unique in that only other people who have had this same kind of discovery can relate to. That's and to why find so it out so late, it. you know, like it's not something so you find late. out as a child. It's something you find out when, when you've already oh, formed it, your entire I mean, worldview. It can throw your whole existence into question. Right, right. She discovered the secret shortly after she told her parents she was planning to appear on Henry Louis Gates Jr.'s Finding Your Roots, <laughs> a PBS series where celebrities learn about, and they were like, uh-oh, um, to learn about their ancestors through DNA testing. Having held in, on to the secret for several decades, Washington's mom, Valerie, a professor, and dad, Earl, a real estate agent, had a private conversation with Gates. So they contacted Gates and said, we got to talk about this. Wow. Uh, who told them it was always best for families to discuss such revelations privately prior to filming. Yeah. What came next, says Washington, was a text message from her parents inviting her to a family sit down in the spring of 2018. Hmm. When I got this information, I was like, oh, now I know my story. Um, 
Had she suspected, uh, do you think? Or was this completely right. blindsided I, her? She, I, well, I think we all suspect something is off. Some of us who aren't NPEs still suspect something's off, but it's it, it's not... That is true. Th- that, that's not... We're not correct in our assumptions. It's something else is off. <laughs> There's something off with everybody, bottom line. I like this sentence. I didn't know what my story was, but I was playing the supporting character in their story. Mm. Which is very much how adoptees feel as sure. well. I bet, yeah. yeah. You're like, you are. You were brought into this family to play a part. Mm. And, you, and for you not to go along with the premise... Uh, is is uncomfortable for them. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, she says she kept her calm and asked a lot of questions while trying to give her parents grace in what was clearly a difficult moment for them. She learned that they opted to use an anonymous sperm donor to help conceive after struggling with fertility issues. They admitted they had all but decided never to tell her. I mean, really? I think that dissonance of like somebody is not telling me something about my body made me feel like there was something in my body I had to fix. She says, struggling for years with anxiety, self-esteem issues, and an eating disorder when she was young. She now feels those might have been symptoms of subconsciously sensing her parents' secret. Hmm. Armed with the new information, Washington says it led her to want to tell the world her story and thicker than water which is her book, is the result. This is really kind of me working to understand my life up until now, given this information that I have that in many ways felt like sort of a missing puzzle piece. My parents were not thrilled about me writing this, uh, she notes, though the couple grew supportive throughout the process. But, says the star, this really is a book about me. I now get to step into being the most important person in my life. Right, and not the supporting role. Yeah, that's interesting. Exactly. Yeah. The experience ultimately added a new layer to Washington's bond with her parents. Um, I really started to have so much more love and compassion and understanding for my parents, she says, taking this deep dive. So that's really uh, an, an interesting insight as well because a lot of parents don't want to tell us these secrets that they hold on to for years or other people in the family the secrets, such as, biological mothers who never told her children there had been a a child that she had given up. Right. And their feeling was, uh, oh, they would never forgive me. They wouldn't understand. And so she, they feel that it would be better not to tell the other children when in fact, when the other children do find out, it kind of explains so much. The other part of this that's strange to me. And again, I I'm sure, I don't know their, particular circumstances but it's not like I don't know her mother had an affair while she was married to her father and, and gave birth right I mean, which, which is a whole other level right, right which I mean I could sort of go okay there's some kind of shame involved here and it's something really ugly between the parents but this was a, a, a conscious choice to use a sperm donor explain to me what the shame is in that there is no shame yeah I, I mean there should be no shame but the difference is that that child should know from the very beginning. And also there should be no such thing as an anonymous sperm donor. Mm. I'm wondering, there's nothing in this. I'm wondering if she now knows who her biological father is. Yeah. Well, Bob's her uncle and maybe it's her earlier father. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, uh, maybe Carrie, Carrie, I bet Carrie listens to cut off jeans. Um, Carrie, (laughs) reach out to me. I'll help you. (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure she's found. Oh, so she didn't talk about in the book. She doesn't she, talk about that at all. Oh, maybe in the book she does, but it's not mentioned in the article. Yeah, art. yeah. I guess that's a way to get people to buy the book. Well, huh? I would also imagine that if she was going on that Henry Gates show, that they could, you know. Oh, um, right. Find oh, out. oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. She already, somebody like the best people in the business already have her DNA. Yeah. So never mind. <laughs> so uh, yet another one. I'm still waiting for a famous adoptee to come out and speak truth. Are, are you being like, you, you know somebody specific or are you just saying any? Oh, any? I know lots of, there are lots of famous adoptees who only talk about adoption is beautiful and, and blah, 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 and never talk about their discomfort with it or, and not to say they, they had discomfort with it, but most of us do. Um, but, they're kind of playing along with the lead story, which is adoption is beautiful. And in the case of, I've talked about this before, of what's his name, uh, the football player, 
um, the you kneeler. You lost me at football. <laughs> <laughs> like, if it was some Broadway Kaepernick. star, I'd be like, oh, yes, I know who that I is. Know. <laughs> I know. Um, Colin Kaepernick. He said one thing in his book about an experience he had with his white adoptive parents that made him feel that 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 he felt like they were they were commenting on the race that he was a part of when he said that he wanted he wanted cornrows and they told him that it would make him look like a thug. Mm. And he just and that's not that is not not uh calling out his parents that is telling a very real story that so many of us experience and has an impact on our entire lives. Your parents uh, wouldn't let you have cornrows either? They wouldn't let me have cornrows <laughs> because thug, you know. Um, <laughs> no, but there were many things my parents said to and about me that were just not okay, and I'm not going to go through them right now, but I've talked about a lot of it before. Mm-hmm. That, And in their mind, they didn't see it, obviously, as as harmful, uh, but it was, and this is why there needs to be education for potential adoptive parents. Right. So there you go. So my point was Colin Kaepernick is the only uh, high-profile adoptee that has ever really spoken truth to uh, about his experience, and he got reamed by everybody, as I, in a courtroom, got reamed <laughs> by a jury... The, uh, the lesson here is keep it to yourself. No. <laughs> yes. Right. Well, yes. And suffer in silence. Suffer in silence. The truth yes. is not, the truth may be in your genes, but keep it in your, keep it to yourself. Yeah. Keep it out of your mouth. <laughs> um, That's like yeah, the complete opposite true. of what our whole podcast has been about. Exactly. All these years. Uh, somebody, I saw a quote yesterday that was, um, I speak, I speak out about my trauma for all the people who are keeping it in. Mm. So, you know, those of us who do speak out about it, or I have many friends who are adoptees that like what I post all the time, but have never said it out loud themselves, but are saying, yeah, me too. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. But they would not, they're still in that place where they don't, they're <clears throat> not comfortable because they don't want to get the abuse that those of us who do speak out I, about it You get. know what? I get that too, especially on social media. I mean, there are things I agree with and I'm like, or disagree with, and I just don't want to get in that fight. You know, I don't want to put sure. my horse in that race because I feel like there's so much um, hatred out there. I just don't want to be, you know. There is, but we have to push through that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but yeah. there needs to be the more people that speak about it, the more that's going to change. I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. You're right. And, right. and it just, it's what uh, everyone has their own, um, their own experience. priorities and their experience yeah. and their priorities as to what they want to speak out about. Because you can't speak out about everything or you would never shut up. <laughs> you would never live your life. You would just like present. Th- well, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, honestly, there, there's so many things that you're passionate about, but you have to, yeah. you only have so much bandwidth for every one of them. right? Absolutely. Yes. You're absolutely right. Yes. yes. And also I think it's important that people stay in their lane. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Cause the people, most of the people that, uh, abuse and troll adoptees on social media are peop- are either adoptive parents who think that they're being attacked personally or people that which the general population that believes that adoption is beautiful and nothing else and people yeah those people and who they don't- for some reason think they have uh, a horse in the race yeah and they don't and they don't it's it's and like, they don't yeah yeah <laughs> exactly all right moving on to even more depressing news. Oh, dear. <laughs> and I'm sure we've uh, no, all heard about it. I don't it. think that was a depressing story. I mean, that's a woman finding out her truth. I mean, it maybe might have been a little it traumatic, is, but, but she did say that she has a more um, a, well, a more interesting... What, not interesting. Again, a it's giving a public face. Right, yeah. it's, and it's giving a public face to NPEs that every man... And truth be told, every man is more willing to listen to... A celebrity. Yeah. I'm using finger. No, but she said she has a better relationship or at least more understanding relationship with her parents because of they've gone through this. And But I bet there's a lot. I, I mean, there's so many more layers now, I'm oh, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sure it's not all rainbows and, and unicorns. Yeah, they weren't happy that she was going to write about it, you know. Yeah, well. Yeah, but there you go. 
It's her story. It is her yeah. story. So I'm sorry. So moving on. Moving on. So uh, I think we've probably all heard about this, but let's talk about it. Um, so 23andMe user t- data targeting Ashkenazi Jews online, leaked online. Yep. So a database that has been shared on the dark web forums and viewed by NBC News as a hit list of, let's say, a million people um, (laughs) who allegedly have used the service. Hackers have compiled a giant apparent list of people with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry after taking that information from the genetic testing service 23andMe, which is now being shared on the Internet. On the dark web. Uh, it includes their first and last name, sex, and 23andMe's evaluation of where their ancestors came from. The database is, in, is titled Ashkenazi DNA Data of Celebrities, though most of the people on, on it aren't famous. So what's up with that? And it appears to have been sorted to only include people with Ashkenazi heritage. So you're on that list, Richard. Yes, but I don't think I'm at 23andMe. No, you're not. But still, I, you know what? Here's the thing. As as a, a person who is Jewish um, yep. and was raised a Jew, this kind of thing is really terrifying. Because once Absolutely you're, once you're put is. on a list, especially in a place like the dark web, I don't even want to get into what's going on in Israel right now. But I mean, Ugh. it just it brings up memories of pogroms and things like that in the yes. past. And once you're on a list like that and, and the... Um, there is a regime change where you live and what the country that you live in, wherever that yeah. may be, you're not mm-hmm. necessarily as safe as you, you don't feel safe. Absolutely not. Well, I think I dare say the Jewish community has not felt safe uh, in the le- for the last six years. Well. Considering things that have happened in our country. As a Jew, we're never going to feel safe. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Like, well, so one person who appears in the database said, crazy, this could be used by Nazis. Let me be clear. <laughs> could be is, uh, no, this is, if you are singling out Jews, you're a Nazi. I totally agree with you. And I feel like, um, to quote my grandmother, my Jewish grandmother, no good can come from this. I just said that. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, I knew you're a Jewish grandma. Of course you did. The company is still investigating the incident, but is treating the leak as authentic. In an emailed statement, a 23andMe spokesperson said the company believes it wasn't hacked per se. Instead, it believes that the hackers simply gained some users' passwords that had been hacked and leaked from other sites, then exploited the fact that 23andMe can give users vast access to each other's genetic information. Mm. So the information, what they basically, they don't know what to do with the genome, obviously, but what they can see is who is related to those people. Right. And essentially, if you're 100% Ashkenazi Jew, so are your, well, your, your, all of your matches are somewhat Ashkenazi Jew. In Nazi Germany, it didn't matter if you had one parent if you're, uh, that was not yes, Jewish. you were Jewish. You were Jewish. Yes. You, it, that would still send you to the gas chamber. And so yes. um, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but mm-hmm. this is what, you know, history repeats itself. And I'm not saying this is where we're going to end up, yep. but we have yep. to be aware of it. And if we don't um, talk about it, uh, we will just be ignorant and be in sure. the dark about Absolutely. this. And you know yes. what? Quite frankly, every day there's some kind of leak of data, of your bank data, whatever, but this was targeting yeah. a Jewish population yes. on purpose. Absolutely. And, you know, I am. I would be remiss in not talking about it, but my, my feeling about not talking about it is, ugh, there are enough people now that don't want to take DNA tests because they're afraid of the government taking our data or... Right. What have you? Don't right. believe in it. And I, I, you know, I get it. Um, but this is not that kind of a leak. This is not that. They're not taking the genome. They are taking the ethnicity estimates and all of their matches just so that they can compile a list of Jewish people. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think we're, we would all be fools if we um, don't consider that every time we sign up for an email list or, you know, online banking or anything mm-hmm. like that, that it, that we're putting our um, personal data at risk. Absolutely. And yeah. I, even when I took my DNA test with Ancestry, I felt the same mm-hmm. way, like, uh, you know, here it is and it's very personal, but you hope that the, the safeguards are there and you do everything you can. But 
uh, you really, <laughs> we, yeah. we don't live in a world where everything can be private anymore. And Well, and certainly uh, the, the thing is like it takes their name and sex. A lot of users on 23andMe only use initials. You don't have to use your real name. If you're a celebrity, usually you don't. Right. So, you know, which makes it harder for people like me. Um, and also, 23andMe is notoriously, I, I mean, people never respond to messages on 23andMe, even though there is an internal message system. It's just not as good um, for genetic genealogists as ancestry. And it's certainly but, not going to do any um, good for the future, like you said, about people who are fear, uh, who fear yeah. testing and having their information yeah. out there, um, particularly if you're Jewish. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. It's, it's horrifying, yes. really. All right, should we take a break? Let's do that. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. Or consider supporting us on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash cutoff jeans podcast. Now back to Julie and me. I think we all know. Uh, We've all heard of the movie The Blind Side. Yes. Um, And shocking revelations have come out about this that is horrifying, frankly. And first of all, let me say all of this is alleged because it's just now in the courts. Um, Well, for those uh, uh, who are listening who don't know The Blind Side, why don't you tell them what that was? All right, so Michael Orr is a retired NFL star, and he was... His story was made into the movie where he was taken out of grinding poverty by a wealthy white family uh, in a 2009 movie. Um, Sandra Bullock was the star of that. Yes, and I think she won an Oscar, didn't she? I think she she was nominated, yeah. Yes. Um, So she... So uh, he petitioned a Tennessee court on Monday with allegations that a central element of the story was a lie concocted by the family to enrich itself at his expense. The 14-page petition petition filed in Shelby County, Tennessee probate court alleges that Sean and Lee, Leanne Tui, who took Oher into their home as a high school student, never adopted him. The whole movie is about how they adopted him. Um, They never actually legally adopted him. Instead, less than three months after he turned 18 in 2004, the petition says the couple tricked him into signing a document making them his conservators, which gave them legal authority to make business deals in his name. Okay. Let that let that kind of sink in there. The petition further alleges that the two has used their power as conservators to strike a deal that paid them and their two birth children millions of dollars in royalties from an Oscar winning film that earned more than three hundred million dollar while dollars while Oher got nothing for a story that would not have existed without him. In the years since the Tuies have continued calling the 37 year old Oher their adopted son and have used that as assertion to promote their foundation as well as Leanne Tuies work as an author and motivational speaker. Hmm. The lie of Michael's adoption is one upon which co-conservators Leanne Tui and Sean Tui have enriched themselves at the expense of their ward, the undersigned Michael Oher, the legal filing says. He discovered his lie to his chagrin and embarrassment in February of 2023 when he learned that the conservatorship to which he consented on the basis that doing so would make him a member of the Tui family, in fact, provided him no familial relationship with the Tuis. They did not immediately return phone calls. Uh, Sean Tui told the Daily Memphian website that he was stunned by Oher's allegations and said the Tuies didn't make any money off of the movie, only a share of proceeds from Michael Lewis's book, which was the foundation of the film. We're devastated, Sean Tui told the outlet. It's upsetting to think we would make money off any of our children, but we're going to love Michael at 37 just like we loved him. So his story became a book and eventually a film that was nominated for two Academy Awards. Uh, Ower's petition asked the court to end the Tui's conservatorship. He is still under the conservatorship and to issue an injunction barring them from using his name and likeness. It also seeks a full accounting of the money the Tui's earned using Ower's name and to have the couple pay him his fair share of profits as well as unspecified compensatory and punitive damages. Since at least August of 2004, conservators have allowed Michael specifically and the public Uh, generally to believe that conservators adopted Michael and have used that untruth to gain financial advantages for themselves and the foundations which they own or which they exercise control. All monies made in said manner should be in all conscience and equity be disgorged and paid over to the ward. 
Alor uh, Oher was a rising high school senior when he signed the conservatorship papers, and he was he has written that the Tuies told him that there was essentially no difference between adoption and conservatorship. There's a big difference. They explained to me that it means pretty much the exact same thing as adoptive parents, but the laws were just written in a way that took my age into account. Uh, Oher wrote, uh, that's not true. Oher wrote in his 2011 best-selling memoir, I Beat the Odds. Hold on. The deal lists all four Tui family members, all four, meaning their other children or their their biological children as having the same representative at Creative Artists Agency. But Ora's agent, who would receive movie contract and payment notices, is listed as Deborah Brannon, a close family friend of the Chewies, and the same lawyer who filed the 2004 conservatorship petition. Brannon did not return phone calls. In the past, the Tuies have denied making much money from the movie, uh, saying they received a flat fee for the story and did not reap any of the movie's profits. And what they did earn, they added, was shared with Oher. We divided it five ways, she said. Uh, Oher's court petition said he never received any money from the movie, even though he long suspected that others were profiting. According to his attorney, whenever Oher asked questions, he did not get straight news. Hmm. Uh, uh, straight answers. And since the film's success coincided with the star of his lucrative NFL career in 2009, Oher did not take the time to fully investigate the deal until he retired in 2016. Mike didn't grow up with a stable family life, Strange said. When the Tui family told Mike they loved him and wanted to adopt him, it filled a void that had been with him his entire life. Discovering that he wasn't actually adopted devastated Mike and wounded him deeply. I guess my question would be, why now? And um, He just found out. Yeah, but I mean, did... <laughs> Did he not question it? The movie came out in 2009. Well, that, that is part of this. In his new book, Michael Orr says the film depicting his life has been a large source of some of my deepest hurt and pain over the last 14 years. So he wasn't happy with the movie. Mike's relationship with the Tui family started to decline when he discovered that he was portrayed in the movie as unintelligent. So in the movie, if you recall... I um, never saw the movie. Okay, I, I actually didn't football, either. and I yes, was like, you Me know. too, me too. But yeah. uh, I do recall that he was portrayed as having some sort of intellectual, intellectual disability. Mm. And he doesn't. So, yeah, he, was, he didn't like the way he was portrayed. It hurt his feelings. He's now married and has kids and is retired from football. Um, but I want to talk mainly about the conservatorship thing versus the adoption thing. Okay. So in, in the uh, adoption reform community, our main thing is that we don't like the fact that we were entered into a legally binding contract before we could consent. And then we had to live that our entire lives. Um, so we, we don't like the idea of conservatorship, but we like the idea of having all the benefits of adoption, being a part of a family without changing your name, hiding any of your history, or you know, doing anything that takes away your original identity while still being yeah. a part of this family. Yeah. Because that's the only difference. And it's a legal, legally binding. It's a legal document that you're not allowed to know these things, that all these things don't matter, even though they, they do to you. The fact that he was supposedly adopted at 18 is was encouraging because that's when we can all consent to these things. Yeah. Anyone that goes into a legal guardianship as opposed to a legal adoption, their rights have not been taken from them because they know their name. They know who their parents were. They know their history. There are no secrets. Then when they're 18 and consent to whether or not they actually want to be a legal part of this family, if they want to change their name then, if they want to make it a legal adoption, great, because they can consent to it. I and see. that's what he was doing. That's what he thought he was doing. Yeah. But no, it became a financial deal for the Tui family, from what I can tell. Yeah, I have major questions about this, and I don't know enough about it to have any kind of judgment. But I And I assume that other people who know more about it than I do have probably written about it. But yeah. I just question a lot, of the, a lot of this. Like, how do you know that you're signing a conservatorship? Or you don't know that you're signing a conservatorship at 18 versus adoption papers? And well, the, it sounds like they lied to him. It sounds yeah. like they said, yeah, this is not an adoption, but it's just like an adoption. Right. But yeah. because you're 18, we can't adopt you, which is not true. 
You yeah. can adopt adults. Really? Yes. <laughs> Yes, you can. Wow. You can. And that should be, I, I believe that that's really when that legal contract should happen because babies don't have legal rights and we can't consent. Well, so, why don't we throw it out to our listeners and if they want to talk about it in on the Facebook, uh, Cut Off Jeans Facebook page, they can, uh, you know, people, yes. or people who have read the book and or seen the movie or have read about this case right. because right. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because... Clearly, we're only getting part of the story here. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I want to say something really fast about the Facebook group. Um, there is also a Cut Off Jeans pace, Facebook page, which is just a page, but nothing ever happens on it. And a lot of people follow that, um, and they may not realize that there is a private group that they can join. So when you, if you're still, if you think you're on the page, but not in the group, go uh, do Cut Off Jeans Cut off Jean's podcast private group, and there's a picture of my father standing on a cliff um, that will tell you which one. And it's private, so you have to answer a question to join. But that's where the action happens. Great. Let's take a break. Let's. Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans with Julie Dixon Jackson and Richard Castle. You can support us by going to patreon.com forward slash cut off jeans podcast. Now back to the program. Hi guys, we are back. So what happened, what have happened was that I did not press record to tell the last story (laughs) or to tell the story that I'm about to tell now. And I told the whole thing with Richard there, but we ran out of time and then I realized that I uh, had not recorded, which was a problem. So I am going to just tell you guys that story and Richard is going to be strangely silent. So here we go. Uh, this is, I'm still telling the story of my trip to the UK, walking in the footsteps of my ancestors. Before we went to St. Jad's, we wanted to go by Grove House. How, what was Grove House and how did I know about Grove House? In 18, the 1841 census, I'd found out my second great-grandfather, Charles Fisher, who was the one who came to Australia, was living in a place called Thorns, which is, that's the, uh, people used to name their properties, um, with the Reynolds family. Now, the Reynolds family were his mother, Anne Reynolds Fisher's family. His grandfather was there, as well as his uncles and aunts, and he was living with them as opposed to with his parents. In the, um, so yeah, I found him in 1841. He was there with his paternal grandfather, Jerry Reynolds, my fourth great grandfather, as well as his mother, Anne's mostly adult siblings. So he was living with his Reynolds uncles and aunts at Thorns in the the 1851 census. Jerry Reynolds had died in 1846. Other than his baptismal record at St. Chad, there had never been any recorded time of Charles living with his parents. I have no idea why. In fact, in the 1851 census, Anne Reynolds Fisher was living and working at at a woolen mill with two of their daughters, of Charles's sisters, um, and she was listed as married. So I can only assume that she was working in this mill and they provided lodging for the workers there, which happened. Um, and But I couldn't find anything from my third great-grandfather, George, at that time until, 19, until 1861, where he is living alone and listed as a widow. So that tells me that unless he was lying and had died sometimes, sometime in the 1850s or 1860. Um, Charles, my second great-grandfather, left for Australia in 1863 to join his brother Edward, who'd already migrated there. Back in Diggle, by 1871 and 1881, the Reynolds siblings had built and moved into Grove House and Grove Mill and Cottages. There's no census available after 1881 yet, um, So I have no idea how long they were there and how long it was in the family, but I did know that according to Google Maps, Grove House was still in existence and just up a ways from behind the Diggle Hotel. So we went up there, and once again, there was something that should not be a road. It just led to a few properties, private properties. Um, It seemed like a private driveway, but as it went to several properties... It's probably just something that the local council didn't feel like they needed to repair or something. But it was at one point we just parked and walked further up because it felt too um, uh, problematic to try to drive the 
borrowed car there that my brother had borrowed. <laughs> anyway, we got there. It was awesome because the the house is huge and it's up on a hillside, but the gate is right at the end of that road and it's got uh, an, a wrought iron gate that actually has Grove House uh, in the, it's written in the iron, the coils or whatever you call it, still says Grove House. There's also a little sign next to the gate that's pointing up the hill that says Grove Cottages, and that's up the hill. It's where the mill used to be and the cottages used to be. They lived there on and off several, uh, a, a few of them. So we got to see that, and it was really cool because I had this tactile history, once again, of my and my brother's existence or the existence of our people from who we derive. That was very cool. So, you know, then we went on to St. Chad's. Uh, when I got back, I, it still bothered me that I had never been able to find this place called Thorns, which is where the Reynolds and my second great grandfather had lived before they went to Grove House. And remember people like Grove House, people named their properties and there were rarely numbered street addresses. So it always just said Thorns. And Thorns is referenced on some streets in Diggle and some places, but nothing told me exactly where it was. So I decided to go back as I was decompressing uh, into the tree and see if I could solve it. And I saw something I'd never seen before. In the 1861 census, there are the Reynolds siblings, all living under one roof, the oldest being John, and he is listed as a woolen manufacturer and innkeeper. Never noticed that before. I scanned over to the address and it said thorns, but above it, it said the Preston Arms. And I'd never noticed that before, or I, maybe I did, but at the time didn't know the significance of it and didn't know how I was going to be able to research that. So I went back to my Saddleworth Pubs book, which is the book that lists all the licensees and their establishments in that area, uh, the same place I found the Diggle, uh, the, the Tunnel and Tavern, and the other hotels that were in my family. And the Preston Arms was indeed a pub that was run by John Reynolds and family and was also known as thorns it was there and but it still didn't say where it was and I had to know so I googled Preston Arms Diggle and the first thing that came up was a document entitled Buildings of Historical and Architectural Interest Saddleworth Local List Record so it's now called Preston House and it's architecturally significant, apparently. And it says the property was an alehouse from 1846 to 1920. And in the Saddleworth Pub book, it read the, bachelor, the two bachelor brothers, so those were the two older Reynolds brothers, had progressed from being handloom weavers to flannel and shawl manufacturers whilst running the Preston Arms on Standage Road, Census 1841 to 1861. In 1869, they left the Preston Arms and moved to Grove House. That was written in the Saddleworth Pubs book by Rob McGee. So then I Googled Preston House and it brought up articles about a pretty well known British prog rock band called Barclay James Harvest. And a one, one passage says the ambitious group attracted an early patron in local, they're from the area. The ambitious group attracted an early patron in local fashion entrepreneur, John Crowther, who had bought Preston House, a semi-derelict farmhouse in nearby Diggle, into which the group move, moved en masse. Uh, and quotes, we all more or less quit our jobs and threw holiday pay and final pay into a pot. And with, this, with his help, we were going to write the hit single. Lee's recalls, who was the lead singer and guitarist of this band. So, but it still didn't say where it was. I knew it was on Standage Road. Standage Road is quite long. So I went to the Saddleworth Community Forum on Facebook. Very helpful. Facebook, very helpful. Can anyone tell me the exact location of Preston House? And I put in parentheses, Standage Road, question mark. Formerly the Preston Arms until 1920. Uh, formerly Thorns until sometime in the 18. 40s to 60s. And I got a few responses of people saying, yeah, it's just on Standage Road, but it didn't say specifically where. Um, and then I got a private message from somebody in uh, my DMs on 
Facebook and it said, hello, I saw your post on Saddleworth Community Forum about Preston House. That's our house. Is uh, If there's anything in particular you're interested in that we can help with, please just let us know. Best regards, Mark and Ruth. So Mark saw my post and they were the last ones to buy this and that is now their house and he knows a lot of the history of it he has a lot of the things that I have or that I have found out that he'd be happy to share with me but I already have them but also said next time I come back there he'd be happy to take me on a tour it was really really nice and just gives me another reason to go um but here's the thing he was he told me exactly where it was and here's the amazing thing. If you remember when we were looking for the Diggle Hotel, they kept taking us onto this little road that, as I recall, a goat, a goat trail or something that was off of Standage Road, and it was called Car Lane, and C-A-R-R. And uh, we were sure that this couldn't possibly be it. We went through it several times saying there must be a better way to find it. This house is off Standage Road at Car Lane. So that hairpin turn that got us onto Car Lane, there was this house that we passed several times and it was right there. And I didn't know the significance of it at the time. But I love that I now know that. Wish I'd known it then, but I have more reasons to go back. So... There you go. All right. That is the end of this week's episode. I am Richard Castle, and you can uh, go to the website, richardcastle.com, and find out all things me. Um, you could also go to lovestingsmusical.com and find out more about my Love Stings musical. I'm actually working on a new show, too, but there's nothing about that yet on the web because it's still being written. But you'll hear about it, I'm sure, in future episodes. Or you can follow me on um, the Twitter, I guess, X. I, I never know what to call it. X, at Castle Songs, or on Instagram as well. I'm Julie Dixon Jackson. You can find me at cutoffjeans.com. Please join the Facebook group. Uh, find me on TikTok, Jen Genie, Jules Jackson. Uh, find the podcast on Instagram. We also have a YouTube page that I put some things on sometimes. You can also listen to the podcast there, but you probably already know that. And as always, the truth is in your genes. <laughs>